Hey everybody, I'm in Adelaide, Australia as part of the International Space University's Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program. We've had two former astronauts living with us, that is Jean-Jacques Favier and Dr. Robert Thursk, and I had the chance to talk to Bob Thursk about his time on the International Space Station. This is your space pod for February 2nd, 2015. So with me today is Dr. Robert Thursk from the Canadian Space Agency. He's a former astronaut and he was lucky to fly on Columbia as part of STS-78. This mission performed heaps of science and um, life science and material science experiments in the space lab module that they took up with them. Bob also had the privilege to fly on the International Space Station as he launched on May 27, 2009 on a Soyuz vehicle as part of Expedition 20 and 21. He had the opportunity to live in space for about six months in a unique environment of the orbiting laboratory of the International Space Station. However, we receive a lot of criticism for the International Space Station and the space program in general, as some people think that perhaps this program is a waste of taxpayers' money, that there are problems on the Earth that need to be solved, and why are we using our money for space? So I wanted to ask you, Bob, when there are things on Earth that could be helped by using the money we use on the space station, what are the some direct benefits to Earth that we get from doing science on the International Space Station? I think there's uh, many uh, categories of benefits that uh, investment in space uh, provides to society on Earth. Uh, first of all, in my case, I'm from a Canadian, so therefore I can speak from the Canadian point of view. Number one, it's jobs and it's the economy. So in a typical year, Canadian taxpayers will invest about $250 million in the space program in, in general. Uh, but our industry, our space industry, not the aerospace industry, just the space industry, in a typical year, reaps back $3 billion of revenue. And 40% of that comes from the export market. So just starting off right away, it's a no-brainer. We, we make money uh, doing it. Uh, secondly, uh, the technology that we develop for spaceflight to, to work in a harsh environment of a vacuum and weightlessness and the ionizing radiation environment of, of space is top quality. Uh, and a lot of that technology we can spin off to other applications uh, on, on Earth as well. Classic example is the uh, robotic technology that we developed for, first of all, the space shuttle program and then the International Space Station program. It works great in space. It does assembly work, it um, retrieves satellites, it uh, deploys satellites, it supports astronauts during spacewalk. But we took that same technology, the control systems for the robot arm, the gearing in the shoulder, the elbow and the, the wrist joint, the vision system that we developed for space application, and we developed a robot for the operating room for neurosurgical patients. Um, at my university in, in Calgary, the University of Calgary, we have a robot that um, uh, performs surgery on people's brains. It does brains, uh, removes uh, tumors. It corrects arterial malformations in the brain. And it uh, relieves patients of uh, the damaging effects of hydrocephalus. The robot arm is just as dexterous as a neurosurgeon's hands, but it's tremor free and uh, it's extremely precise. So that's just uh, examples of just the tangible benefits that uh, investment in space provides to, um, to society, let alone the intangible benefits, which I think are even more important. But it's not just um, but, uh, wonderful examples there. A lot of people might think that the International Space Station is just used for governmental agencies, but it's not just for governments, is it? Universities and schools can be involved as well. Universities and schools can be involved and even uh, corporations, small businesses and uh, medium-sized businesses that wish to demonstrate a technology in space have access to it as, as well through their, their home space agency. So any university in Canada, for example, uh, any university, uh, sorry, any uh, corporation in Canada that wants to make use of it can apply through the Canadian Space uh, Agency and have, have access to it. So you're, you're absolutely right there. And we've flown experiments, for example, from the University of New Brunswick, Canadian University, that wants to improve the quality of lumber that their province 
their companies sell to consumers when they go to a lumber store on the weekend to buy uh, planks of wood for home projects. Uh, the quality of the lumber is improving because of you know the research that the university was doing on the on the ground before. Another company uh, in Quebec, which is a province in Canada, has applied and worked with the Canadian Space Agency to develop something that we call uh, flow cytometer, which is a fancy word, which simply means that it can do blood flow uh, analysis on astronauts in space, doing blood chemistry analysis for astronauts in space to, to keep astronauts healthy. But that same technology can be used back home in remote regions of Canada to provide medical care to um, the Inuit population that live in northern, northern regions as, as well. So, no, it is not just government laboratories that make use of uh, the International Space Station. It's universities and, and small companies as well. Nice. So, what about younger students? So, a minute ago, Lisa, I was saying that uh, perhaps the intangible benefits of space flight are even more important. When I was in grade three, when I was in level three, student in school, I was inspired by the American Apollo Moon Program. And uh, those early American astronauts were my heroes. I knew everything about uh, their backgrounds. I knew everything about the, the missions that they, they flew on. And the space program definitely played a, a role in the direction that my educational path and my career path went later in, um, in life. And I want the same today. I want to help today's young people who uh, have the opportunity to more, do more incredible things than I ever had the opportunity to do in, in space by inspiring them with, with space, uh, catching their, their attention with uh, space projects, and via that teach a little bit of science, teach a little bit of technology, teach a little bit of, um, of math to them. Wow. Are there any interactive um, initiatives going on board station that kids can get involved with? Absolutely. So one that I'm very fond of is called Tomato Sphere. Uh, it's a very simple experiment. Uh, every year, um, the Canadian and the American space agencies fly tomato seeds that are provided by a, a, a famous tomato company called Heinz. We fly 300,000 seeds, so during the, the weeks and months that they're aboard uh, the space station, these seeds are exposed to, well, first of all, the accelerations and decelerations associated with launch and re-entry, but also to up to six months of weightlessness and also the ionizing radiation that uh, they're exposed to during flight. We then retrieve the seeds from uh, the space station and distribute them at present to 15,000 classrooms in Canada, in the United States, and elsewhere around the world, including Australia. We also provide the school children with uh, seeds that did not fly in space and ask the students a very simple question. Do seeds that have flown in space germinate better or worse than seeds that remained on the ground? It's an important question to ask because someday these young people could be on Mars and they're going to have to grow crops for their own food source and for their life support uh, as well. So these students grow the two um, types of seeds in their classroom, monitor the germination rate, measure the seedling growth over the, the weeks uh, during school, and then report the results back to us and we compile them and, and develop a report for that. So these school children are learning a little bit about uh, plant biology, they're learning a little bit about space science, and they're learning a whole lot about the scientific method and they're raising the science culture in our country. Nice. So what about future experiments on the International Space Station then? We've got the kids learning about tomatoes possibly affecting, a space flight affecting tomato growth, uh, but what do we have planned for the remaining eight or so years uh, of the ISS's life? Well, um, first of all, in terms of uh, plants, let's talk about them first. Um, you know, the Mars astronauts who will um, explore Mars perhaps in 20 years from now, those Mars astronauts are alive today, and they're currently in elementary school and primary school. And so we want to make sure that they're inspired to pursue science and technology careers so they're ready to take on the uh, Mars astronaut job. And secondly, we also have to think about some of the new technologies we have to put in place to make that mission safe for them. A mission to Mars is not a walk in the park. It's uh, going to be a risky mission. 
one of the things that we can do to make life easier for them on Mars is to develop uh, crop technology. We don't have a spacecraft big enough to take the astronauts and their food supply to Mars, so we'll ask the Mars astronauts to grow their own crops. So some of the science that we're doing aboard the, the space station this year is to grow certain types of crops, lettuce, potatoes, uh, tomatoes, uh, to see what the issues are so that uh, 20 years from now they, the Mars astronauts will be able to grow crops. Another issue that's come up recently is that uh, we learned that our immune status, astronauts' immune status in space, is not as good as uh, it is here on, on Earth. We're, um, we're susceptible to bacteria infections in space that normally we'd be able to combat here on Earth. Secondly, some of the antibiotic drugs that we'd take uh, on the ground here against bacterial infections are not effective, uh, as effective in space as they are here on Earth. Why? We don't know. So we're going to have to do um, some more research in uh, the immune system in space. And in particular, we're targeting uh, one of the white blood cells. Uh, of course, it's through our bloodstream called T cells. And the initial indication is that they're, uh, they're the problem. They're not as effective in, in space. And then maybe the last important area that we'll be studying over the next couple of years are vision changes in space. Uh, my vision, my, my reading vision in, in space was, uh, was affected. I had difficulty reading uh, in space. And uh, since I flew, about another dozen astronauts have reported the same problem as well. Again, we don't know what is the cause for the, uh, the vision changes in space, but we do know that we uh, can't allow astronauts to go for long duration missions, such as a mission to Mars, without coming up with a, an answer as to what's going on and how we can prevent that. Well, my, uh, wonderful. And uh, my final question for you today, Bob, what was your favorite experiment that you did while you were aboard the International Space Station? <laughs> Lisa, that's a tough question because <laughs> it's like choosing your favorite child, which is impossible. <laughs> Um, I enjoyed them all for um, a, a variety of, um, of reasons. Um, but if you're going to twist my arm, uh, I'll probably say that uh, one of the musculoskeletal experiments that we did was uh, my favorite. Uh, astronauts' bones demineralize in space. Uh, we lose calcium uh, out of our bones, and, it, and it's perfectly adapted to spaceflight. In, in a zero-g floating environment, you no longer need the, the bone strength uh, in space as you need on Earth to combat uh, 1G forces. So it's completely normal for the, the bones to lose calcium and lose strength during space flight. The problem arises that you have to come back home at the end of the mission. So your bones have to be able to endure the, the G forces associated with re-entry and then of course the first few days and weeks back on Earth again without fracturing. Um, we have not yet found a solution to stop the bones from de demineralizing in space. Uh, dietary supplements are helpful. Uh, certain exercises in space are helpful, but it doesn't stop it. Uh, one of the experiments that I did during my six months in space was uh, called Alendronay. Alendronay is the name of a, of a pharmaceutical drug that a lot of people here on Earth take to prevent uh, osteoporosis from, from getting worse. And I uh, participated as one of the first subjects in that study. And uh, all of the results are not yet in. However, uh, I saw my results. And I think that with a combination of dietary modification, uh, vigorous exercise uh, during flight, and then pharmaceutics, I think we're converging on a solution to the bone demineralization problem. We'll see. Great. Well, on behalf of myself and our viewers, I'd like to thank you for your time today to answer our questions. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you for watching, everyone. And I hope you learned a little bit more about why international space station research is important. What questions would you ask Bob Dusk if you had the chance? Leave a comment below, tweet us, or ask us on Facebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash TMRO. I also want to give a huge shout out to all our patrons who have helped to crowdfund this show. We have just hit our next Patreon goal, which will see us delivering you four space pods per month in 2016. And we've finally got your names into the show. So if you'd like to know more about how you can help crowdfund these space pods, or if you just want to get your name into the show too, head over to patreon.com slash spacepod. My name is Lisa Stojanovsky, and until next time, keep on discovering.